Hi, so I wanted to talk a little bit about these things. This is a universal motor. Now, it's called a universal motor because it'll run on AC or DC. I think it's called a universal motor because you find this absolutely everywhere and it really is a useful motor and easy to use, actually, and adapt and change to what you want it to be. Now, I got this one from an old vacuum cleaner, of course, because you know how many vacuum cleaners I find. In uh, Europe and the UK, you find this kind of motor in uh, washing machines. In the US, you actually find uh, usually an induction motor. But you'll find these kind of motors in uh, power tools, hand tools, vacuum cleaners, just this huge range of things. And they're stunningly easy to work with. So what I want to do is give you a close-up of this and talk a little bit about it. OK, so I pulled this motor uh, to pieces just so you can see what it's made up of. So there are the stator coils with the four terminals that we talked about earlier. There's the bulk of the rotor. I've cleaned the commutator already with a bit of wire wool. Here are the end caps, the fan and the brushes. Now you need to have a quick inspect of the brushes to make sure they're nice and clean, not cracked, not chipped, not broken. And if they are, then they're really cheap to replace those. You're talking about a pound or two to replace something like that. When I checked the continuity on this, that it is, a, I took a multimeter and checked the resistance, that coil had a resistance about 1.4 ohms, and that one had an infinite resistance, meaning there was a break in it. Now, these things break because they get overheated. When they get overheated, then the insulation on there burns through, and you get a short on the coil. Now, what very frequently happens, and it's exactly what's happened with this one, is they're joined with these crimps. When they start to overheat, that joint actually is more resistive than the rest of the coil, so it's extremely common for them to break at the crimps. And you'll find the crimps at the top, underneath a little bit of sleeve, there's another crimp under there. So to repair this coil, all I have to do is find the right gauge of wire and put a little bit more wire in there by soldering them together. And the gauge is really easy, just put a multimeter, um, micrometer across it, you'll get the thickness, look up the gauge chart and find yourself a bit of wire the right gauge. Now if you don't have a break in here, you can uncoil that, take all of that wire out and rewind the coil. Now for a cheap motor like this, that wouldn't be worth the trouble. But these kind of motors, they do run up to thousands of pounds. So if what you've got is a burnt out coil and just one coil, it's worth repairing it. Even if it's two coils on the feed coils, it's really worth repairing. This one isn't meant to be repaired, but very often when you find them, particularly, for example, in starter motors, the shoes, which are in here, have a screw on them. You can take the screw out and that whole coil comes out as one piece. So it's very often just well worth repairing them. Now, luckily, as I say, I have found my break here and I checked it was the only break by checking the resistance between here and here and here and here. And I get continuous resistance between those two and between those two, but not between those two. So that's my break. All I have to do, like I say, is solder a piece in there and reassemble the thing and I'll have a working motor. So there's the repair complete. Now I've hooked it up to a DC power source because if we put a DC current down a coil of wire on a lump of iron, we get an electromagnet. So I've joined these two sides up and I've got the negative going in there, the positive going in there. So it basically goes in there, whips around here, comes out here, back in there, whips around there, and comes out there. And those coils are wound in contra uh, windings, so they're wound in opposite windings. If I put a little bit of power in that, we've got an electromagnet. And we can see that just by holding a magnet over it. We've got a nice north-south there. So if I swap that over, it'll go the same way. There you go. So we've got that as the south pole, that as the north pole, as long as we join those two up and we put a negative and positive on there. So that yeah, is now it working. Back together. Now, I've given the field coils and the rotor coils their own independent power because I think it allows much more control. So, for example, if I put power down the rotor, help it along a little bit, that will actually turn even though there's no power going to the field coils, which is really cool. I mean, it has absolutely no torque whatsoever, okay? But we can control the speed of that rotor. By controlling the voltage. So voltage control of the rotor controls the speed. Now if I put uh, power down the field coils, the more power I put in there, the stronger those magnets are. And if we put some power now into the stator, it'll rotate by itself. But now it has torque. 
So torque can be controlled by the amount of uh, power governed by voltage going through the field coils, and speed can be controlled by the amount of power governed by voltage going into the rotor. And I love that. So here's a close-up of the motor, and you can see the field coil linking wire, and you can see the field coil supply wires, black and red, and then the uh, rotor supply wires, green and white. Now, being able to control that torque and speed as independent items is obviously going to be more efficient. If you're going up for hi a hill, for instance, you need more torque, less speed. So you can control the input into each of those to achieve that. But what's really cool about this thing is uh, the motor is actually very cool. Just put a bit of... Oh, I actually want to take that off. <laughs> <laughs> that is some motor! <laughs> I think that's awesome that you can have that much control over a simple motor like that by separating out the field coils and the rotor coils. Now we did something similar with this on a washing machine motor because in the UK and in most of Europe, washing machine motors are universal motors. But in most of North America, washing machine motors are in fact fractional horsepower induction motors, so you can't do this sort of stuff. But these universal motors you'll find in tools and loads of places, vacuum cleaners, that sort of thing. And I think they're great motors to actually play around with, immensely easy to repair. So I thought I'd do the video going a bit more in depth in that. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching.